Does size matter? Give the bitch just opinion on this this week and talk gnosis. Welcome to Talk Gnosis for January 29th, 2014. I'm Bishop Kenneth Canterbury, and as always, I am being joined by my lovely co-host, Bishop Lanny Peterson. How are you this week, Lanny? I am wonderful. How are you, Bishop Ken? I'm doing really, really well. Um... We have a pretty interesting topic uh, this week, and uh, I think uh, our viewers are probably going, what was Bishop Canterbury talking about? Uh, does size matter? But what we are talking about is really the relative small size of most Gnostic churches in their communities, and... Um, this was kind of brought up a few weeks ago when we had Dr. Gregory Singleton on our show. You know, um, near the end of the show, we, we you and Dr. Singleton had an exchange. At mm -hmm. the beginning of the show, which was on the, you know, is there really a, a, a thick dividing line between exoteric and esoteric Christianity, he mm -hmm. brought up that in a lot of churches, large mainstream churches, People don't really know why they're there. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they, they're at the church uh, because they, they're part of that community and they may participate in the worship and the sacraments, but they may not really know their own theology very well. Mm -hmm. And at the end, near the end of the show, you pointed out that this isn't always the case in a lot of the Gnostic communities that you've belonged to. Mm -hmm. And he brought up something that has stuck with me. And that is that, you know, if you have a smaller community, mm -hmm. oftentimes people are a lot more engaged in the beliefs and practices of that particular tradition. And I haven't been able to get this out of my head because mm -hmm. you and I have been around this movement for a long time, and I think we know the frustrations that we have when three people show up for Mass, or right. that we you know, can't get money together to rent a building, much less buy one, right. and that we're constantly running around trying to juggle our secular vocations with our spiritual vocations because we don't get salaries. And this is an mm -hmm. area of a lot of frustration for us, but mm -hmm. uh, Professor Singleton gave me a new perspective on this that you know mm -hmm. maybe this the small community size uh, ca can be a strength particularly if we're willing to harness that so mm -hmm. can I get your thoughts on this Bishop well yeah I mean um, you know I mean a few things I mean that you brought up um, this the small size can be frustrating as we're both aware um, at one time you and I were uh, both members of the same church right. Um and I remember um, this one place that we used to rent up in Kenosha, Wisconsin. At first, it was this beautiful place right in the lake. But then we ended up renting into, like, this office space. And that we would do down in this, like, dungeon of a basement. Um, and we would have this very small, dark little space that, you know, we would have tapestries on the walls and candles. And it became a very intimate place for us. But it's not what most people think of when they have a church. And one of the things that I find kind of interesting when people say, well, do you have a church? You know, um, kind of the idea throws them off that for many of us Gnostics, church could be in our living room. Church could be in our backyard. Church could be uh, like some of my friends uh, up in uh, Georgia, um, up on Arabia Mountain. You know, uh, church can be any place that the priest or the bishop brings the church to. Um, but it can be very frustrating when we're trying to, uh, like you said, kind of raise funds. I can't tell you how many times, you know, um, we didn't get enough offerings because we didn't have enough people show up this week. So I'm opening up my own wallet and thank God I've got, you know, 20, 30, $40 worth of cash I made to throw into the uh, offering plate to make sure that rent is covered for this week. So those things can be frustrating, but on the positive note, um, I would have to agree very much with what Dr. Singleton said, is that you get this sense of community that can only happen on kind of this close proximity mm -hmm. that can't really be manifest when you're in a mega church. I mean, I've attended, God, I used to attend this Roman Catholic church for mass at times, and, you know, on any given mass, there would be 1,100 to 1,400 people there. Yeah. I mean, huge church. And, um, you know, how much community is there when you're 1,400 people at Mass, 
uh, you bow, you do everything you're supposed to, you go up, you take your Eucharist, and you leave, and you get ready for Sunday football. Yeah. There, there, there isn't necessarily a lot of community, and it's, it's, it can also be easy for a lot of the spiritual formation of a lot, if not most, of the congregation to kind of fall by the wayside mm -hmm. because there's a huge amount of uh, time overhead that has to go into administration. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talked. We, you know, we talked about. Uh, no, we don't have any money, but we often didn't have too many bills either. We didn't have a huge debt. We weren't um, constantly fretting about having to 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 pay bills. Yeah, we had a, a rent payment to make, but other than that, we didn't have a whole lot of expenses. So we were actually able, I recall, to mm -hmm. to develop relationships between us. And I, I want you to get your opinion on something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Professor Singleton talked about the kind of exchanges that people can have in small faith communities. Eventually, these exchanges can produce something greater than some of its parts mm -hmm. there you know and do you think i mean as, as a gnostic do you think that while we're certainly all responsible for our own inner development mm -hmm. do you think that there's a, a greater possibility of people achieving spiritual maturity gnosis if you want to call it by working intensely with each other um, I'm going to probably sound like a heretic on this but yes <laughs> I think so I think that there is a a synergy that happens that that the results are greater when there's two three four or more than a sole practitioner and it's I guess been one of my arguments for many for years of people who oh I'm just a sole practitioner I'm just a sole practitioner you know we kind of get that biblical idea of where two or three are gathered in my name I am present and um, I really believe that is 110% true that if there is even a small group of us, two, three, four, or five, that you do start seeing almost this um, um, kind of multiplication of, you know, you get two people, there's a certain amount of energy, three, a certain amount of energy. Now, that being said, I almost think there is a cutoff limit to that. Mm -hmm. I think you start getting too much and that energy level starts, uh, starts to drop. Uh, but I think that, especially where you can keep it small enough, we're still intimate. You know, yeah. we're, um, and intimate in many ways, intimate, you know, in close proximity where you're not in this large space where the priest is, you know, 500 yards from where you are, um, close enough where, you know, I'm not needing a mega microphone and a sound projection system for, for people to hear me close enough where, uh, um, you know, it's easy for me to sit there and really feel that energy from 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 the people I'm with. And uh, to me, it makes um, a huge difference. All of my very positive experiences spiritually has always been with groups of smaller congregations, smaller amounts of clergy. That has been my experience. It's interesting, uh, you know, growing up even as a teenage Pentecostal, <laughs> I was involved with house churches. And uh, while I have been involved with, with standard congregations that meet in mm -hmm. buildings and there's, you know, a hundred or more at worship or whatnot, my most fruitful spiritual uh, experiences have always been in very small home-based communities or communities that rent, rent space in another building uh, mm -hmm. where there's, you know, anywhere between five and, and, and maybe 20 of us. Mm -hmm. That's really been uh, where I've I've, I've experienced the most growth spiritually, and that, I'm speaking for myself, of course, and that may be mm -hmm. part of my personality. I don't know, um, mm -hmm. but I, I will say that that that's been the case for me as well. Um, and kind of moving along, um, if we can, you know, maybe see some of these advantages, there are ways that we can, within these small Gnostic communities, uh, nurture each other and, and remain open, of course. We don't want to be closed, mm -hmm. but we can certainly nurture that through the things that you maybe can't do as a large church. I mean, uh, I'm part of the Jonite community here in the Chicago area, and mm -hmm. we can do things like have monthly Coffee, by, uh, coffee and study groups. Um, it's easy for us to get together for an agape meal at somebody's home. We don't have to worry about security concerns and that sort of thing. So there's a real opportunity to develop love, which I think is an essential part 
of any practice. I think as we learn to love the other, we can open our hearts up to love of the divine. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very crucial part of our practice. Well, I, I think you nailed it right in the head. I mean, uh, again, it's back to this intimacy idea. And uh, you do develop, I mean, true brotherhood, I think, in the truest sense. And you develop love and these things that sometimes just aren't present in large communities. I mean, even from our own experiences, you know, I remember many times either before Mass, getting together with people and maybe going to a coffee shop and sitting down having coffee and a little bit of discussion, then going uh, to Mass and then either depends upon the situation. Sometimes there's a little talk before, sometimes it's during the homily, sometimes afterwards, and then we pack up our gear and, hey, let's all head over to Marina Gardens or yeah. let's all, you know, uh, head over to a congregants. I have a, a great memory of, um, of one of our congregants up in uh, Wisconsin, a um, brother by the name of, uh, of Dom. I don't know if you remembered him at all. Uh, Don and his wife, Tina, uh, we actually married Don. And um, uh, I cannot tell you how many times, you know, he would kind of surprise us um, at the beginning of Mass and be like, oh, by the way, um, when you guys are done, you know, for all of the members of your clergy and anyone that you want to bring over, my, my wife and I, we prepared this wonderful meal for you. And we would go over to his house and he would have these great prepared meals, which would then lead to great kind of after conversation. And uh, I actually have a, a friend visiting me from out of the country right now. And one of the topics I was discussing with him is that I have found, you know, that some of the um, greatest experiences I've had um, has been just as much in kind of those conversations that have happened after the liturgy Yep. as much as the spiritual practices that take place within the contents of the church. Yeah, I, and I, I, you know, I know what you're talking about. I know from where you speak, and that's always been one of the most significant parts of my religious practice is, mm -hmm. is developing, the, those con having those conversations. And one, an interesting thing, I was reading an article by a father of a poor Clare nun, and mm -hmm. the poor Clares are cloistered. They don't leave the cloister. Um, it's a small group. And something that the father addressed is people ask him, well, don't you think that cloisters are primarily for neurotic young women? And what he said was, look, in a small controlled community like that, it's like a pressure cooker. In point of fact, any neurosis is going to erupt. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be made very obvious very early on in the young nun's vocation, and that's going to be addressed or she's going to have to leave. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think sometimes it's easy to hide out in a larger uh, congregation, never really developing oneself. Not that there's anything wrong with a person who maybe just needs a period of time to mm -hmm. stand back, go to church on Sunday, and, and go home because they may have some, some issues that they need to deal with. But mm -hmm. The spiritual development that can happen in a smaller community is, yeah, you can get confronted on things. And yes, you're going to have to, if you're annoying the people in the, com in the community or you're having conflict, you have a chance to learn about yourself in that, pro mm -hmm. in, in, in that um, context. And I think that that can be very important. Mm -hmm. and, and I agree. And I think that, um, you know, again, we've got this... People can participate as much or little as they want in a small community. If they want to kind of sit back and uh, just kick back in their seat and uh, take the Eucharist and leave, we're okay with that if they want more participation. But I think that the door is a little bit more inviting from that. But I think you bring out a good point when you were talking about this, these cloister nuns. And especially, I think, in, in um, our groups where many come and it does give such a strong interest that many of them want to get involved in formations. And maybe it's not formations to the point of them ever wanting to become a priest. Maybe, uh, you know, they just want to become an active member of the church. Maybe they just want to study more. Maybe um, they're going to be happy receiving minor orders or uh, they want to one day become a deacon in the church. Um, but because of the small size, um, you're 100% correct. It can't act as a pressure cooker. And I think that we can definitely see things that may not present themselves if there were so many people that people kind of get lost in the mix. Yes. 
and, and I think that that um, that's something that people need to consider. Why are they going to church? Are they going just for being a part of something, or do they really hope to develop themselves spiritually so mm -hmm. that they can better know their God? And mm -hmm. I think that's a question that folks have to ask. Now, let's play a little devil's advocate here. Is there anything wrong with trying to develop a larger congregation? I mean, there, there are some advantages to having a larger congregation. You're not always worried about uh, getting thrown out of the office space or basement mm -hmm. or person's outbuilding that you're meeting in. Uh, there may be some uh, funds available for clergy who mm -hmm. are oftentimes run ragged. Um, mm -hmm. There may be the ability to develop a children's program. A lot of people, once they have kids, they want to go to a church that has a Sunday school or a nursery, something that you don't see at a lot of our Gnostic churches. So, uh, Ken, do, do you think that there is room for some church growth strategy? Well, I think absolutely. And I think that if you look at the Gnostic community as a whole, I mean, there's some large organizations out there. But those organizations may have smaller bodies. Um, I think that a lot depends upon uh, kind of the local regional bishops who are in charge, along with a priest, to make sure that if they do develop, that there's still that sense of community. But I totally understand, I mean, the points you're making, because I think those are all valid points. I think that uh, in many cases, larger churches could do good. Um, we could have... Um, clergy that in some form was reimbursed, whether the churches were paying for housing or others where maybe, you know, our clergy didn't have to work a job and then try to do community service and do, I mean, like you said, it, it can feel like you're burning a candle on both ends and being pulled in both directions. So, you know, there's definitely, um, I think, some pros of a larger church. Um, my own personal experience has been, if they get too big, things can get a little chaotic and maybe not where they really we want them to be but i think maybe that is just something that as uh, gnostic uh, priests and bishops and uh, clerics that is an issue we need to deal with and learn and develop more in ourselves to be able to make these larger communities grow i can't say that i'm necessarily opposed to them i just don't think most of us have been experienced to them to really know how to kind of cope with with that new added stress in our life. Absolutely. Uh, wise words there. Um, we're going to have to start wrapping up here. We're running low on time, but this has been a really fruitful discussion, Bishop Ken. I'm hoping that you and I and others can continue it because I think it's an important discussion for Absolutely. us to be having. Um, I do have a bit of news and uh, talking about local communities. Um, I am not a Jonite cleric, but the, uh, I am part of the local group, uh, Jonite group that meets in the Chicago area, and I'm pleased to announce that the Apostolic Jonite Church uh, is going to is opening up a new mission in Northwest Indiana, and it there will be the that particular mission will be holding its first Eucharist at 11 a.m. on February 2nd, 2014. If you want to get more information, I'm going to be there at the Eucharist, um, and it's going to be conducted under Rector uh, Reverend Deacon John, John DeGilio, who's been a guest on our show. And nice. if you want to get more information, you can visit the group uh, at www.meetup.com, mission brfp slash events slash 161-687702. Um, also to remind everybody that the Jonite Church will be holding its 15th Conclave, uh, uh, May 21st to the 27th, 2014, here in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, it's going to be, I think, a wonderful time. You can go visit the Jonite website at www.jonite.org, and right there on the front page, there is a large graphic link to the Conclave if you want to find out about attending. Um, awesome. Also, just one more thing, uh, for those mm -hmm. who are on the West Coast, uh, in the middle of, uh, over for President's Day weekend in February, there was a huge uh, convention of pagans and magical practitioners called Pantheacon. Uh, I will be in attendance, and I'm also co-host of the infamous Green Fairy Parties. We've not been around for the past two years, but we were around for many years before, and we are coming back this year, and I will be attending bar and hope to meet any Tognosis viewers who are going to be at the convention. So, oh, that sounds like a fun time. Yeah, it's going to be a great time. So I'd love to mix you a cocktail and have some have some discussion. So if you come by, uh, please do say hello. 
Fantastic. Well, again, um, you know, I want to just mention to all of our viewers, make sure you leave us YouTube comments. We, we really do appreciate those when we try to have some dialogue there. Um, if you have other comments, you can always send us an email at talknosis at gnosticnyc.com. You can also find us on Facebook at Facebook slash talknosis. Uh, we appreciate all of our viewers. And if there's uh, any topics you want to see us discuss, make sure you drop us a line. It's how we stay active on uh, on what our viewers want is pop us a note and then we can say, hey, yeah, this is something that we think would be of interest to many people. Absolutely. And if you have any ideas for guests, let us know that too. Absolutely. Okay. And as always, this has been a production of the Gnostic NYC Network. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends, click the like button, and subscribe to our channel. Opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily represent the views of Gnostic NYC or any other organization. No animals were harmed during the production of the show. For more Talknosis, tune in every Wednesday for new episodes. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night, everyone. Good night.